We read today in Revelation chapter 19 for our scripture. Uh, one of the greatest and most joyful days of a person's life is his wedding day. And I'm sure a lot of you would agree with that. I hope you, a lot of you would agree with that. Uh, I've only I've been uh, uh, involved in one wedding, but I've performed a lot of them, several hundred over the years. I, I used to write every one of them down and try to keep up with that. I wish I'd done that all the years so I'd know exactly how many. The first one I did was my cousin's wedding in his living room. The last one I did was Paige and Caleb's, and Paige and Caleb's has la already lasted longer than a few of those that I performed during the years, I'm sorry to say. Uh, they don't all turn out so well. But anyway, uh, most uh, young girls and some boys, they anticipate and plan for that wedding uh, for a long, long time. When I, and when I was growing up, my sisters and most, I think, most other young girls had a hope chest. Any of y'all know what I'm talking about, a hope chest? And when a girl was just real, real young, her mother would help her set it up, and she would start through the years putting in sheets and, and pillowcases and dishes and things like that, getting ready so that when she got married, she would have at least a few of the things that she would need. And I guess they called them hope chests because she hoped she'd get married one day and get to use all that stuff. Do they still do that? I haven't heard anybody talk about hope chests in a long time. So that's another thing I talk about that shows you how old I am, I guess. They, uh, but anyway, the, from the time a, a young girl, a girl is very young, she starts thinking about her wedding day and what it's going to be like, and she starts making plans about how she's going to be dressed and what she's going to wear and what the decorations are going to be like and, and all that kind of thing in, in very great detail. And then uh, when the, the couple becomes engaged and it's announced and the wedding is scheduled and uh, announced months ahead of time and then the day comes and the wedding is celebrated with family and friends and usually at great expense, not always, but sometimes. The wedding is memorialized with pictures and video and then it's celebrated every year for years and years to come, that wedding day. As we look at how Jesus is revealed in Revelation, we see in Revelation 19 that he is pictured as the bridegroom uh, and he who is engaged to his bride, the church, and that one day he is coming to claim his bride. Someone has imagined how if, if they wrote up that wedding the way they do other weddings, how it would read in the paper the next week. And it would go something like this. Yesterday, the Lamb of God took His bride into Himself in a service presided over by the Heavenly Father. The bride was dressed in garments of glorious white. She was spotless and without blemish. The groom was clothed in, it in glory, as is His custom. The angelic hosts lifted their voices together and praised the name of the Most High God, while the cherubim and seraphim hovered above them, crying, Holy, Holy, Holy. Uh, after the service, the couple left heaven to return to earth for a thousand-year honeymoon. And when they return, they plan to spend eternity get together in the palaces of heaven. And I think that's a pretty good description of what this is going to be like. Let's read our scripture in Revelation chapter 19, and we'll start at verse 6. And it says, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude... And as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to Him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And He said unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Now sometimes when we read the Scripture, we tend to try to read into it our customs and interpret the Scripture that way. But I want to remind you that for the most part, the, the, the Bible was, is a Jewish book. And the, a lot of the customs that are written about are Jewish customs. And most of the authors were Jewish men. And so we, we do an injustice to the Scriptures to try to put an American interpretation on, on uh, the, the activities and the events and 
uh, the scriptures that are there. So I want us to talk about this from the standpoint of the kind of wedding that a, a Jewish person would have because, you know, in the flesh, Jesus was a Jew. And this, I believe this account was written from a Jewish perspective. There are, of course, in a wedding, there are participants. There is the bridegroom. Jesus identified himself as the bridegroom several places in Scripture. In Matthew chapter 9 and verse 14, it says, Then the disciples come to John, that's John the Baptist, and they saying, why do, uh, why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples don't fast? And Jesus said, uh, they came, I'm sorry, they came to Jesus. And, and Jesus said, Can the children of the bedchamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then they shall fast. Jesus said, I'm, He's telling them, I'm the bridegroom. And people don't fast while the bridegroom is with them. They celebrate. They rejoice. And so Jesus tells, himself, tells us that He is the bridegroom there. In the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus compared His return to a bridegroom returning for His bride, like it does here in Matthew 19. In Matthew, or in Ephesians chapter 5, that is a passage that we read at weddings often. And it says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as to the Lord. So he compares here uh, the, the husband to the Lord Jesus. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be unto their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the cleansing of water by the word, that he might present uh, it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. In Ephesians 5.32, he says, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So uh, throughout the scripture, Jesus identifies himself as the bride, or as the bridegroom, excuse me. John the Baptist identified Jesus as the bridegroom, and he himself as the friend of the bridegroom. There's a passage there in John chapter 3 where some people are coming to John the Baptist, and they are thinking uh, that he is the Savior, that he is the Messiah, that he is filling the role that Jesus actually uh, was the person that Jesus was and the role that he filled. But John the Baptist says to them, He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom which stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. And this my joy therefore is fulfilled. John the Baptist said, I'm not the bridegroom, I'm the friend of the bridegroom. And our custom, with the way we do things, would say, well, John the Baptist was the best man. Um, in an American ceremony, the groom and the attendants, you know, when the wedding gets ready to start, they've got them kind of hit out over in the corner, and they just sneak in through the side door and come stand in the front. And nobody pays much attention to them. And then when the bride starts in, the music gets loud, everybody stands up, the doors fly open, and they play real loud, here comes the bride. And everybody turns their attention to him, and, you know, and the, the, the groomsman and the groom, they can be up there picking their nose or whatever, and nobody's going to pay attention to them. It's just kind of a necessary decoration that has to be there for the bride to have her wedding day, right? But in an Oriental or a Jewish wedding, the bridegroom himself, he is the center of attention. Uh, so Jesus is identified here as the bridegroom, and so when he talks in Revelation 19 about the bridegroom coming, that bridegroom is Jesus. Of course, in any wedding, there is a bride these same verses that indicate that Jesus is the bridegroom indicate that the, that the bride is the church, and that is significant. At any wedding, there are guests. I guess I have performed just a very few, maybe a half dozen weddings where it's just the bride and the groom and, and no guests there. Some states require witnesses to, sign the, to be there and sign the a wedding license. Arkansas does not. So, you know, if a couple wants to get married, they can just come, just be the three of us, and we can perform a legal wedding. Again, that's not the case in every state. But, uh, but at most weddings, there are guests. And I have presided where there were no guests, and I've presided where there was a huge church full of guests. The, uh, there will be guests at this wedding that Revelation talks about. The angels will be there as guests. Uh, we... Uh, 
there's a multitude, they, and they, perform, they are the choir who perform the music, apparently. There will be uh, believers there, people who've been saved but who are not part of the church, and they will be there as guests. The Old Testament saints will be there. You know, there was no church in the Old Testament times, but people were saved through looking forward to, in, to Christ in faith in the Old Testament times. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and, and David and all those people, they're not part of the bride, but they will be at the wedding feast as guests. Uh, the, uh, Jesus established His church during His earthly ministry on earth, so there was no church before then. John the Baptist will be there as a guest. We already read there in John chapter 3 where he said, I'm not the bridegroom, and obviously he's, he, he, and he was not the bride either, but he calls himself the friend of the bridegroom. And so the friend, the, the best, the, the friend of the bridegroom, again in our terminology, the best man, John the Baptist will be there as an honored guest. The tribulation period saints will be there as well as guests. I believe not everybody agree, and not everybody will agree with this statement, but I believe the church will be taken away from the earth before the tribulation starts. We talked about that some. Uh, there are several verses to me that indicate that. And so there will be no church on earth during the tribulation period, but God is going to raise up two witnesses, and then those 144,000 Jews will be evangelists, and so the gospel is going to be preached during the tribulation period. And people are going to get saved, and they're going to go to heaven, but they're not going to be part of the bride. But the, the ones who have died during the tribulation period and, and gone up to heaven in spirit, they will be there as guests at this wedding, uh, in this wedding feast. All those who've been saved but have never joined a, ch a scriptural church will be there. And, uh, you know, some people, I understand some people being saved and being in the church is simultaneous. They mean the same thing. But I think the scripture differentiates that. Galatians 3.26 says that, that we are everyone who's saved is part of the family of God. It says we're all children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. But if you read, for instance, in Acts chapter 2, the, the, what most people focus on the day of Pentecost is when they, uh, the Holy Spirit came in power and people spoke in languages that they didn't know and there were other miracles that took place. But the, the, what, if you look toward the end of Acts chapter 2, what happened? Peter preached the gospel. People heard it. The Holy Spirit convicted them. They said, men and brethren, we, you know, he told them, you have taken Jesus and you killed him. You say you've been looking for Jesus to come and he came, and what did you do? You killed him. And it says they were pricked in their hearts, and they said, what are we going to do about that? And he told them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the, name of the, in the name of the Lord Jesus. And the Scripture says, and that day there were 3,000 people who were added to the church, it says they that gladly received his word were baptized, and that same day there were 3,000 people added to the church. So you get into the family of God by your faith in Christ, and then in addition to that, to get in a smaller a group of people, a smaller circle of people, you get baptized and you join the church, and that's how I believe the Scripture teaches, that's how you become part of the church, that's how you become part of the bride. After, believing, after the believing uh, thief on the cross, you know, he is an exception because he died on the cross, he did not have, not have opportunity to profess his faith through baptism. After that, I don't believe you can find any person in Scripture in the New Testament who, profess, who accepted Christ as their Savior that did not follow through and confess Him by faith and baptism and become part of the church. But in our modern day, it's a lot different. I've known a lot of people who gave very good testimonies of receiving Christ, but for whatever reason... They never confess Him through baptism. They never join a church. Well, it's my understanding that these people will be, they will be in heaven, obviously, because they've accepted Christ. But I believe they will be at this wedding celebration as guests and not as part of the bride. So there's going to be the bridegroom. He will be the center of attention rather than the bride. The bride will be there. And she, of course, is very significant. You can't have a wedding without a bride. And then there will be guests who are there as well. So that is the, the participants in the wedding. Then let's talk about the procedure of the wedding. And it's a Jewish celebration was quite different than the way that we do things. And I think, this, uh, again, the New Testament accounts of, of marriage and wedding were written from a Jewish perspective. 
there was the first stage of the procedure of the wedding was called a betrothal. Or in, uh, in the case of, Ma of Mary and Joseph, it's described an espousal. Uh, Joseph and Mary were espoused to each other. Um, it's similar to our modern engagement, except that the betrothal was legally binding. And, you know, today a couple gets engaged. They plan to get married, but they have a falling out about something, and they just decide we're not right for each other. It's not God's plan for us. So they break off the engagement. And it can be, you know, it can be very emotional and, and disappointing and a lot of things like that. But uh, there's no legal filing has to be made. It's just they agree to, to not follow through with the marriage. But in, Ju in the Jewish situation, when they got betrothed, that was considered legally binding. And it could only be broken through death or by filing a legal document, which was uh, uh, basically a divorce, it's called. And that was the case with Joseph and Mary, that when Joseph found out she was expecting, that he decided to get a divorce to break off the betrothal, the espousal. During this time, uh, it was again, it was legally binding by law, the, but the couple was not allowed to live with each other during this time. They were not allowed to share uh, a bed together at this time. Uh, and, uh, but it was a, a time when they were committed to each other. They got to know each other. This was usually arranged by the parents, sometimes even before they were born. Like one, here would be this couple, and, and they, had, they were friends with this other couple, and they said, you know, I really like your family. We're really good friends. I tell you what, if you have a, a daughter and we have a son, let's arrange, let's, let's uh, agree that they're going to get married. And so they would make that contract sometimes before the children were even born. And sometimes it would be shortly after the children were born. And so, you know, that sounds terrible to us that you would have to marry somebody that your parents picked out for you. Usually, a lot of times it goes the opposite, you know. We found out that when, uh, with our kids, when they brought somebody home, if we didn't like them very much, we sure didn't say anything because that would make them like them more. And if we did like them a whole lot, we didn't say very much because that would, that would tend to kind of make them shun them, uh, drive them away. And, you know, they didn't let us pick who they married, but we're, we're pretty happy with who they got. We think they did, we think they did pretty well. But this was, in that, under that situation, instead of marrying the one you loved, it was kind of, well, you're with this person, you better learn to love them. You know, that's going to make life easier for you if you do. And if they were good to each other, then they would, if they didn't love each other to start with, that would, that would grow. And so it was an arranged marriage either before they were born or shortly after they were born. Well, Jesus and his bride are in that stage of marriage right now. They are in that betrothal period. In 2 Corinthians 11, 2, Jesus said, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused or I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. That stage of marriage, betrothal, figuratively it begins when a person gives his heart and his life to Jesus. So if you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, you're in that stage of betrothal, espousal, which is similar to what we in our culture call engagement. After the betrothal, uh, sometime afterward, usually, there would be the ceremony. When the wedding drew near, so this couple, they grow up, the, the marriage has been arranged by their, uh, by their families, and so they grow up all their lives knowing that I'm going to be married to this person, you know, and uh, I don't know what they really thought about that, but that's the way it was. And then when it got close to the time for the wedding, the, uh, the bridegroom's a father would uh, send the friend of the bridegroom to tell the bride and her attendants that it was almost time, that he's coming for you, uh, maybe today, maybe tomorrow, but it's getting close for the wedding. And so then they would, the bride and her attendants would make themselves ready, and they would wait for the bridegroom to come at a, a, at a time that he hadn't really told them, I'll be there at 10 o'clock or I'll be there at 12 o'clock, but he said the, when they came, they said it's almost time. And so they would, the, the bride and the attendants, they would get, get themselves ready and be prepared. And that's why they were called ladies in waiting. 
because they were getting ready and waiting for the bridegroom to come. And then when everything was ready, the groom and his friends would come and get his bride, and they would take her and attendants back to the house that he had prepared for them. Usually, it would be a wing that was built on to the parents' house, and so that if, uh, and so that they had an extended family, kind of like the old Dallas show with the Ewings, you know, where all the, all the family lived on the same place, and they just had another wing to it. Well, that's the way they did it in Jewish times most times. They would just add a wing onto mom and dad's house, and if you had several sons, it eventually you'd build a, that one wing, one wing, and kind of close it in, and it would be like a, a, a big round type house with a courtyard in the middle. But anyway, he would take his bride back to the home that he had prepared for her, and uh, there would be, there the, it would be a private ceremony. The, uh, the guests were not invited to the wedding ceremony, just the bride and the groom and the parents and, and a few attendants and the rabbi who would perform the service. And they would exchange gifts, and there would be singing and celebration and rejoicing. At that stage, the ceremony itself is, uh, compares to when Jesus comes back in the rapture. When he comes at the beginning, comes in the clouds at the beginning of the tribulation period and says, it's time for the wedding, let's go to the house. When Jesus left, he said, I've gone to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. And that's what he's talking about. And once, so this will be similar to the ceremony. And uh, so that is that stage. So there is the betrothal, there's the ceremony. And then the big part is not the wedding itself, but the big part is the, the wedding feast or the wedding celebration. After the marriage ceremony, a feast would be held. And that's very similar to the way we do our wedding receptions after the wedding. And it could last for a few hours, or it might last for six or seven days. It depended on how wealthy the parents were and what kind of resources they had. And this was kind of a status thing. The longer, uh, the longer you could have the party, the longer the feast would last. That showed that you were very wealthy, or at least you were before the wedding anyway, huh? And uh, so this might last for a long time, uh, for several days, even up to a week. And the wedding feast would probably be the most important and significant person in a Jewish person's life. That would be even more important than his bar mitzvah day when he was recognized as an adult, uh, when he was recognized as a, a grown man, as an adult. Uh, this was a, a very, very significant day, a great day of recognition, great day of celebration. And then that stage of marriage, the celebration that will occur, it's written here in Revelation 19, at the very end of the tribulation period, right before Jesus comes back with his saints and overthrows the enemy, and puts the devil in a, uh, in a pit, and he establishes thousand-year reign on earth. Uh, that will, the thousand-year reign will kind of be the honeymoon of the bride and, uh, and the bridegroom. And this celebration uh, will be on earth for a, not just a day or, or seven days, but for a thousand years, and then it will continue on in heaven throughout eternity and will never end. Um, in Revelation 21, verse 9 and 10, he says, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues. And he talked with me, and he said, Come here, and I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Now, in Revelation 21, it talks about heaven. It talks about the new Jerusalem. And it says that he saw the new Jerusalem, that holy city, descending out of heaven. And so the new Jerusalem is not heaven. The new Jerusalem is part of heaven. And I, the new Jerusalem is the, the home that Jesus is preparing for his bride to be with him throughout eternity. So there are the participants of the wedding. There's the procedure of the wedding. And then there's the preparations for the wedding. Weddings don't take much preparation, do they, Tammy? <laughs> a 
lot of you have been through that, and you know how, uh, how detailed that has to be, how elaborate it can be, and how stressful it can be. You know, they have a TV show, they still have that show called Bridezilla's, and I promise you that's not a fairy tale. I have wit personally witnessed that on a few occasions, unfortunately. Weddings can be very stressful because it's supposed to be a joyous time. But sometimes, you know, the bride's got her idea of what it's be about, and, and the bride's mother has her idea of what it's supposed to be about, and the bride's grandmother has her idea of what it's supposed to be about, and, and every aunt and great aunt that there's got to chip in about, no, I don't think you ought to do it that way. So it can be pretty stressful, but there's a lot of preparations that go into it. Revelation 19.7 says that the bride has made herself ready. Uh, the, it, there's a lot of preparation, especially in our culture, especially for the bride, you know. She gets her gown ordered and fitted. We're going through our closets this week trying to get things out. Deb pulled her wedding gown out that she used 48 years ago, and she's been saving it. And So what am I going to do with this? So she said, well, you know, we tried to give it to our daughter when she got married. She didn't want it. We offered it to, we've offered it to kind of to our grandkids, and they don't want it. So she said, well, I'll put it on eBay and see if I can sell it. But we had, had a couple of nibbles, and when we were at Casey's this weekend, she said something about it, and Casey's wife said, well, I want it. And uh, I don't know what she's going to do with it, but she's going to keep it, and, that, and that's fine. But anyway, she gets her gown ordered, and then she gets it fitted, and gets it fitted maybe a few times, and she gets then on the wedding day or the day before, she gets her hair done, she gets her makeup done, she gets her nails done, and then she gets to the church very early, and maybe she has some of that stuff done at church on the wedding day and uh, to make the final preparations. And the groom, basically, he does what his bride tells him to do. He may go fishing or hunting that morning. If it's an afternoon wedding, I, I've, I've taken grooms fishing the morning before the wedding, I plead guilty, but we got them back to the church on time. Never had a problem with that. But anyway, uh, he might get a haircut, maybe rent a tux or buy a new suit. Uh, but in our culture, it's the, you know, and I think in the Jewish culture too, the bride was very careful to make sure that she got fixed up nice. She wants to be a, a beautiful bride on her wedding day. And I, I think I could honestly say I, I've, Every bride I have seen has been beautiful on her wedding day. I don't think I've ever seen an ugly bride. Uh, and so, but there's a lot of preparation. In Ephesians 5, again, he says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it by the washing of the word, that he might present him to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Revelation 19.8 says, Unto her was granted that she should be arrayed in linen, clean and white, and the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Now every bride wants to take great care that she's clothed properly, that her hair looks nice, that her nails look good, because much attention is going to be, a pay, uh, going to be paid to the bride and how she looks and to her dress, excuse me, her wedding dress, and all that, and the newspaper's going to go on and on and on about what she wore and, and what, uh, how she had her hair done and what kind of shoes she was wearing and, and all of that. That's, those are important details. He says here that at the, the marriage of the lamb that he wants his bride to be dressed properly too. He wants her to be dressed in clean and white linen, which he says is the righteousness of the saints. Now, as I read and studied the scripture, that word in our English, it doesn't show up, but it does in the original language. Actually, it says righteousnesses. Her, her white robe is the righteousnesses of the saints. It's plural. And so I think that means that there's more than one kind of righteousness that she is supposed to display. A Jewish woman, uh, in that, at least in that Roman culture that they lived, they had on, they wore an inner garment, which is kind of like a, would be what, a slip, kind of. It was called a uh, tunic, and then she wore her wedding gown on the outside, which would be called a toga. 
And so she was supposed to be clean inside and outside as well. That's important. And the inner, inner righteous, the inner purity, that is the positional righteousness that we receive when we trust Jesus as our Savior. And He cleanses us from our sins and He makes us pure and white before Him. And then there is a, but there is an outward righteousness, a practical righteousness that comes from obeying God and keeping His commandments. And so he says that the bride needs to be clothed in righteousnesses, an inward purity and an outward purity as well. Matthew 5.16 says, so let, your righteous, so let your light, your outward righteousness, so shine that, they, that uh, they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. As we look at this uh, account that's given to us in Scripture, let's put that in perspective of where we are today. The bridegroom has betrothed his bride. And if, if you have accepted Jesus as your Savior, you have, are betrothed to him. You have, he's, uh, you have accepted him as your Savior. He has announced the time of the wedding is near throughout Scripture. And especially in Revelation, he tells over and again that he is coming. The time of his coming is near. He's been telling us that over and over and over. And so right now, we are in a time frame when it's, it behooves us to get ourselves ready. And how do we get ourselves ready? How do you get yourself ready to be part of this wedding celebration? Well, the first thing you do is you trust Jesus as your Savior. And that puts you in a personal and intimate relationship with Him. Then it means that you follow Him and obey Him as your Lord. That is part of the white gown that you wear. It means if you've accepted Jesus, then you confess your faith in Him through baptism and you unite with His church, which is His bride. I don't know very many people occasionally you have somebody who they're married to somebody and they want to keep it a secret. But most of the time when somebody gets married, they want everybody to know. They're very happy about it. They put the ring on their finger. They put the announcement in the paper. Uh, they invite people to come witness it. It's not something to be ashamed of. It's something to be very thankful for and to let people know. It means to prepare for the wedding Supper, it means to stay faithful to Jesus and His church. And it, le it means to, to live a clean and pure life as you anticipate His return. At the weddings today, we play Here Comes the Bride. But that wedding feast in heaven, the theme will be Here Comes the Bridegroom. He is coming. It's important for us, you know, to want to be there be part of that when he comes now you know I've, I've been to several weddings that I was not a part of I came as a guest and it's really it's really neat to be there as a guest but it doesn't compare with being there as a bride or being there as the groom and you know we don't always get the choice of whether we're the bride or the groom or not that takes two parties who are willing to say yes to each other but we do get to decide whether we're part of this bridegroom, whether we're part of, I'm sorry, whether we're part of this bride, because Jesus' invitation goes out to every one of us to come and trust Him and to confess Him and unite with His church. And so let me ask you, are you ready for this great day, for this great wedding feast? We need to get ready because here comes the bridegroom. You stand, we're going to sing together.